In this video, we're going to walk through how to prepare for a pediatric airway foreign body emergency. These cases often present in the hospital in the middle of the night, and proper preparation is key to success. Once you've seen and examined the patient, spoken to your attending on call, and have decided to move to the operating room, it's essential to go help the team set up. The first thing you will need to do is determine what size uncuffed endotracheal tube is proper fit for this child. Although there are many equations to help answer this question, the most commonly used is this, age plus 16 divided by four, or in this case, one plus 16 divided by four equaling 4.25. Now endotracheal tubes only increase by half sizes, so it's always safest to round down, in this case to a 4.0. I always get one size half smaller and one larger just in case. The 4.0 tells you only the inner diameter of the endotracheal tube but to select which rigid bronchoscope to use, you must know the approximate diameter of the airway. This can either be gleaned from the sizing chart or written directly on the endotracheal tube, often somewhere in the middle of the distance markers. Here you see that the outer diameter is 5.5 millimeters, written just to the right of the 4.0. With the predicted diameter of this child's airway now known, we can select the ideal bronchoscope. Unfortunately, on the standard bronchoscopes used, their size number does not correlate with diameter. Thus, you must either again refer to the sizing chart or look at the end of the bronchoscope. Here, you can see that this is a 3.5 bronchoscope that has an inner diameter of 5 and an outer diameter of 5.7. Although this is 0.2 millimeters larger than our predicted airway, remember that we rounded down in our original equation. There should be no issue fitting this scope into a 16-month-old. Now that we have the correct bronchoscope size, it's time to assemble it. Every piece is custom designed, so they only fit in one place. The light prism is placed just one slot in, so it does not block the lumen from the endoscope. The endoscope adapter is next. There are multiple versions of this depending on your length of scope. This just snaps into place. The instrument adapter allows for small flexible suctions or other instruments to pass through the bronchoscope. In order for these two lumens to line up perfectly, spin the adapter while applying pressure and you will feel a snap. It will not spin in place if it's in the correct position. The white plastic nose goes on top to block air from leaking. Finally, orient the scope light cord adapter in the same orientation as the prism. There should be no resistance. Once in place, the endoscope adapter has a locking mechanism to lock it in place. Again, there are many size and shape combinations between bronchoscopes and endoscopes. I suggest you take some time to test out instrumentation so that you prepare before an emergency occurs. A 3.5 bronchoscope or larger will allow passage of most, if not all, optical forceps that will be used to retrieve a foreign body. So it's now time to select your ideal optical forcep and test it through the bronchoscope. The correct choice depends on your foreign body. Sometimes this is unknown, so it's perfectly fine to have them all ready to go at the start of the case. The one on the far left is a coin grasper with two teeth at the very end, excellent to grab that raised edge of most coins in the world. In the middle is the alligator, which is the workhorse, great for soft or slippery objects. Finally, on the right is the peanut grabber, excellent to get around the peanut's curved surfaces. This is a minimalist setup, but it contains all the essentials for an emergency bronch. It's perfectly fine to have more instruments on standby and no one would fault you for being overprepared. It's time to make sure that they all work correctly before the patient arrives to the room, which is the most important part of the setup. First, make sure the laryngoscope has good light. For this age child, a Philips One blade is perfect. You have a tooth guard, anti-fog pad, and liquid, your correct size endotracheal tube, and your 1% lidocaine, correctly measured for the patient's weight. The McGill forceps are there just in case a foreign body is found somewhere above the glottis and can easily be picked out with these instruments. Now, for the already assembled bronchoscope. Note that we have added a five French flexible suction to the side port. We want to be sure it slides well and is sheathed just proximal to the endoscope so it doesn't block our view. Look through the endoscope with your eye to make sure there are no obstructions to your view and that the endoscope is not broken. You don't want to discover this fact after the patient is anesthetized. The endoscope that you see at the top of the table already hooked up to the camera is a four millimeter zero degree endoscope that I first used to identify the foreign body prior to inserting the bronchoscope. This may not be the preference of your physician, but it doesn't hurt to have it ready. Next, check the functionality of your optical forceps, including to see if the tips come together well. 
These are fragile instruments and the tips can easily bend. If they are, they may not be able to grab your foreign body well and it may detach as you're pulling it out of the airway, which is a dangerous scenario. The endoscope for the optical forceps is unique and longer than the bronchoscope endoscopes. Check its functionality and then insert it to your forceps to see how it looks. It also has a locking mechanism similar to the bronchoscope. You should just be able to see the grabbing element of the instrument. This is the orientation of the room that works best for me. It maximizes situational awareness, allowing all instruments, the patient, the endoscopic view, and the anesthetic vitals all within the surgeon's field of view. Check with your provider to understand which kind of setup they prefer. I believe that in airway emergencies, the airway should always be in the hands of the surgeon at all times. Thus, we hold the mass for induction. The top of the head should be at the level of your xiphoid approximately. Once the child is under adequate anesthesia, a jaw thrust can be applied. It's important not to have the fingertips medial to the mandible as soft tissue compression can completely occlude the hypopharynx and supraglottis. This will allow the anesthesia team to place an IV if one hasn't been done yet. Once the patient is under deep general anesthesia, but still spontaneously breathing, our first step is to apply local anesthesia to the vocal cords. Place the mask down, apply the tooth guard, and open the laryngoscope. This is the way I prefer to hold the laryngoscope to allow my middle ring and pinky finger to help with various tasks during bronchoscopy. The laryngoscope is inserted in the right side of the mouth to completely slide the tongue to the left, follow down into the vallecula to suspend the larynx. It's important to achieve excellent head extension. This allows the shoulders to rise and creates a straight shot from the mouth to carina. In adolescents and adults, this is more difficult, so sometimes a shoulder roll is needed. You can see that with the ring and pinky finger, manipulations of the larynx can be achieved to optimize the view of a difficult airway. Appropriately dosed lidocaine is then directly applied to the vocal cords, the airway is desuspended, the tooth guard removed, and masking restarted. Now that the cords have been anesthetized, it's time to examine the airway. Keep in mind that this technique includes using a 4 mm zero degree endoscope to identify the location and quality of the foreign body. Others may feel that this is an unnecessary step and would advocate just proceeding with the rigid bronch. We keep it here for completeness. Apply the tooth guard and expose the laryngoscope with good extension as before. This time, take the ideal uncuffed endotracheal tube size and place it in the left corner of the mouth. Hold with the free fingers of your left hand and attach to the circuit. This will allow blow by oxygen and inhalational gas as you proceed. Use the suction to clean around the supraglottis and glottis. I would not recommend passing it distal to the cores for risk of changing the orientation of the foreign body. This stimulation of the glottis is also a good test of depth of anesthesia. If the cords twitch aggressively to you touching them, take the instruments out and return to bag masking to get the patient in a deeper plane of anesthesia. Apply the endoscope lens to the antifog agent and wipe it off. Notice his subtle shift in positioning in the overhead camera. Sliding the chair over to the left side of the patient allows for the angle of the scope to become straight rather than angled from the right. You may need to play this back a couple of times because it's subtle, but it makes a big difference in visualization and photo documentation. There are many ways to hold the endoscope, but it's important to be able to position your fingers in a way to allow you to manipulate the focus and take pictures and video. Once you've identified your foreign body, you remove the endoscope, endotracheal tube, laryngoscope, and tooth guard, and return to masking while you plan the ideal extraction method. When inserting the bronchoscope, expose the airway as before. As you approach the larynx, it's helpful to turn the scope that the bevel of the bronchoscope gently pushes the vocal cords out of the way. Once carefully positioned in the trachea, the laryngoscope is removed and the left hand is used to protect the bronchoscope from laying firmly on the patient's alveolar ridge. The left hand can also keep the scope perfectly in position. An assistant, at the same time, switches the anesthesia circuit to the bronchoscope. This is a window adapter and it's a very useful tool for foreign bodies. Some bronchoscope bridge adapters, like the one we use in this video, do not allow the passage of optical forceps. Thus, I like to apply this to the bronchoscope once the bronchoscope is in position in the airway. The rubber cap also minimizes air leak while transitioning throughout the procedure. Notice that the endoscope and bridge adapter are removed together as it can snap off easily. This is handed to your assistant. 
while you're attaching the adapter, the assistant is switching the camera and light cord to the appropriate optical forceps. Often, the optical forceps are heavy at the level of the camera, so it must be supported until fully in the bronchoscope in order to protect the glass rods of the endoscope. Once in position, carefully remove the foreign body by pulling it close to the bronchoscope, but not into it. This will dislodge the foreign body. Remove the whole bronchoscope and foreign body together with care not to drop it at the level of the glottis. Once out, return to masking. It's always a good idea to pass one final time with the endoscope to make sure there are no other foreign bodies or fragments in the airway. Remember, you can never be overprepared for a pediatric airway emergency, and the better prepared you are, the less stressful the procedure will be.